And I feel really fortunate that on a cold day in early January, I got a chance to get an hour of coffee with somebody who is really close to being here. <laughs> and somebody's looking at me, hello, hello. I'm not sure what that meant. There. That, uh, that's what you get a chance for tonight. New Hampshire is the place where whether it's Jimmy Carter in 1976 or 1984, or Paul Simon in 92, John McCain twice, Bernie Sanders last time, you name it. Whether you like that candidate or not, this is the place where dreams can come true. And we're lucky. Because we have a chance to have an event in 2020 with somebody who I believe is going to be the next president of the United States. Ladies and gentlemen. Hello, New Hampshire. Good house to be back. I know you're thinking this is the weirdest orientation for a town hall you have ever seen. That three quarters of us will be looking at his daughter all the time. I don't care what running for prison is all about. I have two words camera and angles. So I'm going to do it this way a whole lot because the camera's over here. So I'm going to do it like my TV. The bad news is, this is what I'm going to look like a lot of the time. <laughs> so if you like attention, this one's the place to sit. <laughs> Thank you all for coming out uh, tonight. I know this is the first snowstorm of the season, so I hope the, the drive isn't so bad. How many of you know I went to high school in the state? Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah it's true. Phillips High School Academy, 1992. Woo! They had me back to speak a number of months ago, and I showed up and I said, I haven't been back. Since I graduated, because I didn't really enjoy my time here. <laughs> and then and then the student body erupted in applause. And I was like, whoa, that wasn't my intended reaction. <laughs> so coming here to New Hampshire feels like a homecoming. Like uh, I spent my adolescence here, and then I went to college at Brown University, not that far away. <laughs> and just thinking of what someone's jelly for the Brown parent or something like that. Uh, and then I, I went to law school, became an unhappy lawyer for five whole months. It was MLS. So when I say unhappy lawyer, the type of law I was practicing, our job was to try and think of the worst thing that could happen and then put them in a contract. And so I was like, why am I spending my 20s thinking about the, the worst things that could happen? I should try and make something positive happen. So I'd like to start a business. How many people have started a business or organization or club or mailing list? Pretty much anything. All right. So if you have your hands up, you know two things. Number one, it's much harder than anyone lets on. And number two, when someone asks you how it's going, what do you say? It's great. Well, there's one answer to that question. So my business went great until it failed. My parents told their friends I was still a lawyer because that was easier and I'm Asian. And so the, the question then was, okay, how do I try and get better at building something? I have to say, despite the cameras, I'm just going to start over. They don't need this footage anyway. <laughs> I'll let you know when the footage becomes important. <laughs> then all of a sudden, it'll be like me very seriously. Uh, so, I was at, um, so after my business flopped, I said, okay, I need to try and get better at this. So I went and worked as the sidekick to a more experienced entrepreneur for four years. And then I became the CEO of an education company that grew to become number one in the U.S. and was bought by a public company in 2009. Um, 2009 was a really rough time in much of the country. How many of you were here as part of New Hampshire in 2009? Oh, a lot of you. So how was it here? In some ways, this place is better sheltered than a lot of other parts of New Hampshire or the country because you, you're, uh, you, you know, a school nearby and the economic flows are not reliant upon housing values in the same way as for most of the country. What you saw in other parts of the state People lose their homes, other parts of the country. And I thought I had some insight as to why the financial crisis had unfolded. Can you believe that the 10s are about to end in the 2010s or whatever the heck we're in? Can you believe that? We're going to be celebrating New Year's Eve here in New Hampshire, Manchester. So if you guys don't have New Year's plans, we're going to come down and, and celebrate. You're liking this. It's going to be a giant yang yang celebration, New Year's Eve in Manchester. We're going to bring it 2020, get rid of this decade. We're going to subsidize the booze heavily. 
It's a great thing about New Hampshire. So what happens in, here in New Hampshire is we raise money in the rest of the country and spend it on you. <laughs> so that includes your New Year's festivities. And you're like, this is an excellent value for New Year's party. An excellent value. And an excellent time. I can't believe that the financial crisis was 10 years ago, right? I can't believe 2009 was 10 years ago. And I saw the financial crisis unfold, and I thought I had some insight as to why it had happened. Because so many of the whiz kids I'd gone to Exeter and Brown and Columbia with had gone to Wall Street and actually devised these mortgage-backed securities and derivatives and exotic financial instruments. Believe it or not, I actually went to school with the people who made that stuff up. And so I thought, wow, what a train wreck. <laughs> This is what we're like educating people to, to create. And so I thought, well, what would you want them to create if you could actually draw it up yourself? I thought, well, I wouldn't want to just send people to Wall Street and Silicon Valley and try and become the next Excel jock or App King or whatever. I would want them to move to places like Detroit or Providence or Cleveland or St. Louis to start a business. But having started a business and failed myself in my 20s, I thought, well, it's going to be too hard fast people just move to a new city and start businesses. So I thought, well, what they could do is they could do what I did, which is work with a more experienced entrepreneur for a couple of years and then get better as an apprentice or a sidekick. And so I started this nonprofit. How many of y'all work nonprofits? You know, the list. Uh, so I put in some money and I started calling rich friends with this question. I said, do you love America? And then the smart among them said, what does it mean if I say yes to this question? <laughs> and then I said, at least $10,000. And the 12 of said, I love America for 10000 That's what I thought you did. So we raised a couple hundred thousand dollars for this nonprofit called Venture for America with a goal of creating thousands of jobs around the country. And what we did is we took enterprising college graduates and paired them up with early stage growth companies in Detroit, Cleveland, Baltimore, Providence to try and help those businesses grow. And then after a couple of years, they wanted to start their own business. We would then have a seed fund and an accelerator to help them do so. Does that sound like a good idea? Yeah. I was yeah. like, who could not be for Venture for America? You'd have to be a great A jerk, right? <laughs> so I started this nonprofit, and it grows and grows to the point where it creates thousands of jobs around the country in 15 cities. So I'm getting accolades and awards. I was recognized by the Obama White House, so I got to bring my wife to meet the president. Uh, my in laws were really excited about me for a week. They were like, oh, my <laughs> daughter did all right. Check out these pics. <laughs> But unfortunately, I had this sinking feeling about what I was seeing in a lot of the country. And you had your hands up. A lot of you have lived here in Hanover for 10 years or more. How many of you are from the Midwest? South? West Coast? Mid-Atlantic, like me. Uh, I grew up in upstate New York. So I had never been to Missouri or Ohio or Alabama or these places that Venture for America was operating in. And I was blown away by the gulf between regions, where if you fly between St. Louis and San Francisco and Michigan and Manhattan, you feel like you're crossing dimensions and decades and ways of life in a few time zones. You know what I mean? Have you had that experience? So I was internalizing that and having this sinking feeling that my organization's job creation efforts were like water into a bathtub that had a giant hole ripped in the bottom, that we were losing many, many jobs more than we were creating. And then Donald Trump won in 2016. You remember that night well, I'm sure. Uh, what were your reactions that night? Uh, despair. Despair. Fear. Horror. Fear. I saw it coming. Someone saw it coming? Anger. Anger. Nausea. Nausea. Yeah. yeah. Disbelief. I remember watching election day returns with my wife saying, oh my gosh. Uh, tens of millions of Americans just decided to take a bet on the narcissist reality TV star. This is a giant stop sign or red flag. This was not like, oh, business as usual. I mean, this was to me a red flag for civilization. And so I started digging into what had happened. And as shocked as many of us were, or some of us saw it coming, it sounds like, we all have family members or friends or neighbors who were excited about his victory, in part because they'd given up on government as responding to our, our needs and problems, and they thought that we can't do any worse than we're doing now. So if you were to turn on cable news today, or really any day since 2016, why would you think that Donald Trump's our president? Hillary, Hillary Clinton slash emails. Russia. 
unfulfilled promises, Facebook, Facebook maybe the FBI, all mixed together into some strange cocktail. But I'm a numbers guy, and the numbers tell a very clear story as to why Donald Trump won. We automated away 4 million manufacturing jobs that were primarily in Michigan, Ohio, Pennsylvania, Wisconsin, Missouri, Iowa. If those states sound familiar, those are all the swing states that Donald Trump needed to win and did win. This happened in New Hampshire too, but it happened a bit earlier. It happened a couple decades ago where the northern mills and plants closed down. And I've been up there, and those areas have never recovered. When I was working as the CEO of Venture of America, I saw this in Michigan, Ohio. Those areas have not recovered either. We automated away those millions of jobs, and unfortunately, what we did to those jobs, we're now doing to the most common jobs in our economy. How many of you have noticed stores closing around where you live in this part of New Hampshire? Are stores closing? Yes, they are. And why are they closing? Amazon, one word answer, right? <laughs> Amazon's soaking up $20 billion in value every single year. How much did Amazon pay in taxes last year? Zero. Zero. That is the math. $20 million out, zero back. 30% of your stores and malls closed. Most common job in the entire country is retail clerk. The average retail clerk is a 39-year-old woman making between $9 and $10 an hour. When her store or mall closes, what's her next move? It's a rhetorical question. If you know, get back to me, because it's happening to hundreds of thousands of people around the country. How many of you have seen a self-serve kiosk in a McDonald's or fast food restaurant? Food service is the third most common job in the US, and they're going to have a self-serve kiosk in every location of McDonald's in the next two years. And they're starting at the front of the house, they're moving to the back of the house. They're working on the robot burger flippers and fry cookers. When you call a customer service line of a big company and you get the software bot, I'm sure you do the exact same thing I do, which is you pound zero, 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 say human, human, representative, representative, as fast as you can, right? So you get someone on the line, and then you're like, oh, a person. How do we do that? <laughs> yeah, the software is miserable. But in two or three short years, the software is going to sound like this. Hey, Andrew, how's it going? What can I do for you? It'll be fast, seamless, delightful, a little bit seductive, perhaps. <laughs> you might not even realize it's software, unless you know. What is that going to mean for the two and a half million Americans who work at call centers right now making $14 an hour? The one that scares me the most is trucking. How many of you all know a truck driver here in New Hampshire? It's the most common job in 29 states. There are three and a half million truckers in this country, 94% men, average age 49, average education high school or one year of college. And my friends in California are working very, very hard on trucks that can drive themselves. Now, why do they care so much about freight? For the money. The cost savings are $168 billion a year. Think about that number for a sec. A year if they can successfully automate away truck driving. And robot trucks are on the highways right now in Arizona. U UPS just invested. Now, the reason they're in Arizona and not New Hampshire is that robot trucks are very bad with something called snow. <laughs> they would struggle mightily with tonight, as an example. They'd be like, meet more. <laughs> like, not sure what to do. <laughs> That's why they talk, too. <laughs> I speak for a while now. Oh, man. <laughs> so how are they going to overcome the snow problem? They're working on teleoperating equipment for these trucks, where, thanks to 5G spectrum, the plan is to beam a teleoperator from Nevada or Arizona into the truck and have them drive it like a video game. There'll be cameras on the front of the truck so you can see it in real time. And so it's like you're sitting in the cab. And then after the computer is sure what to do again, it says you can leave, and then you beam back out. So you'll be sitting in a warehouse in Nevada, Arizona, just waiting for the alert, and then you beam in. And thanks to the zero latency and the cameras, you can drive it like you're in the, the truck. What do you think the ratio will be between teleoperators in Nevada and Arizona and the three and a half million truckers? One to 100, maybe? Two to 100? It's certainly not going to be one to one, right? You've <laughs> got three and a half million truckers like waiting for a truck to beam into. What does that mean for the three and a half million truckers or the seven million plus Americans who work in truck stops, motels, and diners that rely upon a trucker getting out and having a meal? Almost 10% of the jobs in the state of Nebraska support trucking. So what happens when the trucks don't stop in Nebraska anymore? The robot trucks can go 24 seven, whereas the human driven truck has to stop after 14 hours so the driver can get out, can get out and sleep. The 
<laughs> it's called the human driven truck, the trucks, <laughs> essentially stop driving after 14 hours because of the regulations. The, the truck will actually seize up. So if you are a truck driver and you have your life savings tied up in your truck and then you see a robot truck on the highway that never stops, what's your response gonna be? Oh, again, rhetorical question, but we have a sense. So this is the fourth industrial revolution in action. It started with manufacturing, actually started agriculture. Then it moved to manufacturing. Now it's going to retail, call centers, fast food, transportation. And this is before AI leaves the lab and starts eating up a lot of the basic white collar jobs, like accounting. I was an unhappy lawyer long enough to know that AI can do a lot of that job. Yeah. Yeah, it's, you know, it, it's, it's true. It can edit contracts faster and more cheaply than the most talented lawyer. This is why Donald Trump is our president today. Democrats like to talk as if he's the cause of all of our problems. He's not. He's a symptom. He's a manifestation of this economic transformation that is pushing more and more of us to the sidelines. So this is what I was uncovering in 2017. Donald Trump wins. I have this, oh my gosh, what the heck just happened? And so I turn to the numbers in the books, and I find out, okay, this is a straight automation story. We're blasting away the most common jobs in the economy, and people are seizing up and desperate enough to turn to Trump because our government is not responding. So I went to DC. My first move was not to run for president of the United States, because I'm not a crazy person. I'm married and have a family. So I was like, all right, let's go to DC and see what people are going to do. And so what do you think the folks in DC said when I asked them, what are we going to do to help Americans manage the greatest economic transformation in our history? Rhetorical <laughs> question. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. Um, so the big responses I got in DC were, number one, we cannot talk about this, Andrew. Anyway, I actually, someone said to me, Americans are too dumb to understand it anyway. I know, Rob. Number two, we should study this further. And number three, most popular, most common, we must educate and retrain all Americans for the jobs of the future. And I said, that sounds pretty good. But I looked at the studies. Do you all want to guess how effective the government-funded retraining programs were for the manufacturing workers in the Midwest who lost their jobs? I'm anchoring you low, because it's low. <laughs> the real number is zero to 15% success rate. They're essentially a total failure. And when I said this to the folks in DC, you know what they said to me next? I guess we'll get better at it. <laughs> after we've had a study. Yeah, after we've had a study. I came away and I said, oh my gosh, like th this is as dark as I suspected. And one person in DC said something to me that sent me to you all here tonight. He said, Andrew, you're in the wrong town. No one here is going to do anything about this because fundamentally, Washington DC is a town of followers, not leaders. And the only way we will do anything about it is if you create a wave in other parts of the country and bring that wave crashing down on our heads. That was two years ago in New Hampshire, and here we are. Yeah. You may not know it, but you all are the wave. You are the people who are going to rewrite the rules of the 21st century economy to work for us to work for the people, the families, the communities of this country. Now, New Hampshire is a magical place. Uh, how many presidential candidates have you seen? I show of hands, so this would be five, this would be four. It's like, you know, I see a five, a three, a 10, a 10 plus, say, so you just like this, I'm gonna start flashing things. <laughs> now, why are all of the candidates here trying to win your support? It's because we have done the math. Do you know how many Californians each of you is worth? <laughs> <laughs> Approximately 1,000 Californians each. So how many of us are here in this room tonight? 600. <laughs> 600. <laughs> that was a very, very Trumpian estimate. <laughs> 600 people. You know? <laughs> but uh, this is a legitimately crowded room, so I'm going to say like maybe 160, something like that, 200, 160 or 200, it's called 180. <laughs> That's like four and a half football stadiums in California. It's like 180,000 Californians. That is the power you all have. You have the power to shape the future of this country, to turn our history on a dime. That's why I love being here. 
This is one of the only places where democracy still functions the way it was intended. Most of our fellow Americans look up and they see the pipes clogged with lobbyist cash full of money and they say, my vote can do nothing about it. They are generally correct. Their votes can do very, very little about it. But your votes can do a lot. Your votes can do everything. If you decide to point the country in a new direction, that is the way the country goes. That is the power of this place. That's why I love campaigning here. Now you're only a little spoiled by it. You're a little bit like, I don't know about that Yang guy, I just met him the one time. <laughs> <laughs> but there's a very powerful culture here around your vetting of candidates that I love. You know, you can compare it not to candidates of this cycle, but cycle cycles even years and decades ago. So the question is, what are you gonna do with your power? How are you gonna make it so that Amazon doesn't pay zero in taxes anymore? That's your responsibility, legitimately. Whose fault is it that Amazon's paying zero taxes? It's our fault, it's not Amazon's fault. Amazon's job is to pay zero taxes. They're good at their job. It is our job to keep them from doing that. Your job. So how are we gonna rewrite the rules to work for us? If you were here tonight, at some point you heard there's an Asian man running for president who wants to give everyone $1,000 a month. Remember hearing that? First time? You're like, wow, what an interesting gimmick. <laughs> That'll never go anywhere, I'll never see that guy. It's not a new idea and it's not my idea. Thomas Paine was for it at the founding of the country, he called it the citizen's dividend. Martin Luther King fought for it in the 60s, called it the guaranteed minimum income. It is what he was fighting for when he was assassinated in 1968. After the debate in Atlanta, I had the privilege of sitting down with Martin Luther King's son, Martin Luther King III. And the greatest thing about sitting with Martin Luther King III is that when he refers to Martin Luther King, he calls him dad. <laughs> he says, dad said this, dad believed this. And I was like, Martin Luther King was your dad. <laughs> I was like, I guess that makes sense, because that's why I'm spending time with you right now. <laughs> because you're Martin Luther King III. Uh, but this is what he was fighting for, this foundation for all Americans economically. And it was not for any subgroup of Americans, it was for everybody. In 1971, it was so mainstream that it was endorsed by a thousand economists, and it passed the U.S. House of Representatives twice under Richard Nixon. It was called a Family Assistance Plan. It would have created a floor for all Americans. And then 11 years later, one state passed a dividend where now everyone in that state gets between one and two thousand dollars a year, no questions asked. And what state is that, New Hampshire? Alaska. And how do they pay for it? Oil. And what is the oil of the 21st century? Marijuana. Technology. AI, big data, self-driving cars and trucks. A study just came out that said that our data is now worth more than oil. How many of you saw that? How many of you got your data check in the mail? Where did the data check go? It went to Facebook, Amazon, Google, and the big tech companies that are profiting to the tune of billions and billions of dollars and we're not seeing a dime. I interact with technology the same way most of you do. How many of you actually read the I agree, I consent? form before you click on it. Wow, you raise your hand. That's the first one I've seen. Out of thousands. <laughs> what do you do for a living? <laughs> physical therapist? Oh, you're a very, very uh, meticulous physical therapist. <laughs> you do very well with you. So you see this giant I agree, I consent form, and then you click on it, and then you just hope for the best. You're like, oh, I hope, hope nothing too bad happens <laughs> as a result of this. And there was a long time where it felt like an incredible bargain or deal because you were getting these services for free. But the fact is they are not free. Uh, we, we have a hidden cost associated with them and the companies are certainly profiting to the tune of billions and billions of dollars off of our attention and our data. At the deepest level, it can actually fundamentally affect human decision making and agency. We could think that we're making certain decisions, but really we've been led there by a string of digital breadcrumbs. That's how fundamental it can be. So we're not seeing any of the gains of the 21st century economy. They've been hoovered out of your communities, out of most communities, and sucked up to the cloud. And the tech companies are too smart to pay any taxes on it. That is the math behind what is driving many of our communities to distress. You have this $1,000 a month dividend, and it sounds dramatic at first. But if you look at it, if Alaska can do it with oil money, why cannot we do it for everyone with technology and data money? Especially because after the money comes into your hands, how are you going to spend it in real life? Yeah. Education, car repairs, everyday stuff, daycare, occasional light out, little deep sign ups, the stuff of life. How much of it would stay right here in New Hampshire? 
Not all of it. Some of it would float up to the cloud. You'd get your own Netflix password instead of sharing it all the time. <laughs> You're like, I'm sick of getting blocked <laughs> when everyone else is using it. But most of it would stay right here in the state. Right? It would go to car repairs you've been putting off and daycare and, and uh, all the things that make the world go around. This is the trickle up economy, New Hampshire, from our people, our families, and our communities up. And this would work. This would give rural areas a real path forward. This will help rejuvenate Main Street businesses and community organizations that are getting depleted. And the big guys actually win from this too. Now, are the big corporations going to have more business if we're all getting an additional $1,000 a month? Sure. It's one reason why Jamie Diamond, the CEO of J.P. Morgan Chase, actually came out for a plan much like this one. He said, we should declare a national emergency because our economy is not working for most Americans anymore, and we should have a negative income tax, which is essentially an income floor. This is the CEO of J.P. Morgan Chase, Jamie Diamond. So what I'm championing is not a new idea, it's not my idea, and what seems dramatic at first actually becomes necessary and inevitable the more you look at it. This is how we make the economy work for us in the 21st century. And it's going to be up to you all to rewrite the rules and create a new way forward. Because the rest of the country is just looking up, you know, everyone's just going about their day-to-day -day lives. That's the power in this room. Now we have three big economic measurements that we're using to figure out how we're doing as a country. What are they? GDP. Unemployment rate. What's the third? Stock market prices, right? If like those three things are good, then things must be good. Yeah, you're shaking your head, no. This is, this is not the way it is. So corporate profits are at record highs in the United States. What else are, are at record highs? Stress, anxiety, income inequality, drug abuse and overdoses, suicides, mental illness. It has gotten so bad that our life expectancy has declined for the last three years in a row. Do you all know the last time America's life expectancy declined for three years in a row? The Spanish flu global pandemic of 1918. You have to go back 100 years to find another time when life expectancy in America declined for three years in a row. It is highly unusual for life expectancy in a developed country to decline ever. It ordinarily just goes up and up and up. But ours has declined for three years in a row because suicides and drug overdoses have each overtaken vehicle deaths as cause of death for the first time in American history. So I'm going to ask you all, if corporate profits and GDP are at record highs and your life expectancy is declining, which one do you listen to? How many of you have run a business or organization? Imagine if your business or organization was using the wrong measurements. How would your organization do over time? Pretty terribly. That is what's going on in the United States of America right now. GDP is a measurement that we invented 100 years ago. And even the inventor said we should never use this as a measurement of national well-being because it would be terrible for that. And here we are 100 years later following it off a cliff. Robot trucks will be tremendous for GDP. They'll be very, very bad for many American communities. Stock market prices, the bottom 8% of Americans own 8% of stock market wealth in the US. The bottom 50% own essentially zero. So you're trumpeting a measurement that corresponds to the fortunes of the top 20% of your society. And headline unemployment, it doesn't include people who are doing multiple jobs to make ends meet. It doesn't include the fact that 94% of new jobs in this country are temp gig or contract jobs that don't have benefits. It doesn't include the fact that 40% of recent college graduates are doing a job that does not require a degree. So young people here, if you think it's just you, it is not just you. We have loaded you up with debt and then sent you into a job market that is underemploying almost half of you. And then somehow it's your fault. If I was a young person, I would be very, very angry. We have to rewrite the rules to work for you in particular. So the question is, how do you rewrite the rules? Um, it's actually not as hard as you might think because the Bureau of Economic Analysis controls the measurements. And you know who's in charge of the Bureau of Economic Analysis? The President of the United States. <laughs> so as your president, I'm going to go and I'm going to ask you all, if we're being led in the wrong direction by these three big measurements. How would you measure how we're doing if you had the ability to just change it? Quality of life. Quality of life index. That would be great. This man sounds like an economics, uh, an economist or major. The happiness. 
happiness index. How about mental health and freedom from substance abuse, which is very close to happiness index. How about clean air and clean water? How about the proportion of Americans who will be able to retire with dignity? How about childhood success rates? You're not going to believe it. We have numbers for all these things, and we can actually use them as the new measurements for the economy. And it will be my pleasure, my privilege as your president, to actually revise GDP to a new scorecard that includes the real measurements. And after you have the real measurements, then you can see how we're doing. Because if you look at the real measurements, you see we're in a health recession, we're in a mental health recession, we're in an environmental catastrophe. After you start internalizing the cost of what's happening, you see the real problems on the ground, and then you can start to move society forward. One example I use from my own family, my wife is at home with our two boys right now, one of whom is autistic. How much is her work valued at in our economic measurements? Zero. Zero, and we know that's nonsense. We know that she's doing the most important and challenging work of anyone in our society. I was off the road with my family, with my kids, taking care of them for a couple of days. You know, you know what I said after a couple of days? Get me back to something easier, like running for president. <laughs> <laughs> and I love my kids. But it's a lot of work, and parents here know this. So these are some of the ways that we can fundamentally start to rewrite the rules so that they start working for us. This is your challenge, this is your obligation. Donald Trump is our president today in part because he got some of the problems right. He said he was going to make America great again. What did Hillary Clinton say in response? America is already great. America is already great. Remember that? 2016 again. That was not the right response. We have to acknowledge the reality of the problems and then offer real solutions that will help move our country forward. What were Donald Trump's solutions? He said we're going to build a wall, we're going to turn the clock back, we're going to bring the old jobs back. You all know that we have to do the opposite of these things. We have to turn the clock forward. We have to accelerate our economy and society as quickly as possible. We have to evolve in the way we think about ourselves and our work and our value. And I'm the ideal candidate for this job because the opposite of Donald Trump is an Asian man who likes math. <laughs> What does math stand for? Make America, Make America, think, America harder. think harder. This is your job, New Hampshire. We have to bring the real problems to the fore and then bring real solutions. I stand before you tonight. I'm fifth place in the polls to be the Democratic nominee. We raised $10 million last quarter in increments of only $30 each. So my fans are almost as cheap as Bernie's. <laughs> I'm going to share a Bernie story with you all. I was so touched when he told a journalist that he liked me. Because <laughs> I wasn't sure. I've been around him like, you know, a bunch, but I can't really tell Bernie. And so, so at the last debate in Atlanta, I went to him and I said, Bernie, thank you for saying you liked me to a uh, journalist. And then he put his arm around me and said, of course I like you, Andrew. You're bringing a lot of good ideas to the table. That was my terrible Bernie impression. <laughs> and then I, I felt like I'd been knighted by my uncle. <laughs> America's uncle. <laughs> so like Bernie, this is an entirely grassroots people-funded campaign. Zero corporate PAC money, average donations of only $30 each. This is purely us fixing our own problems. I don't owe anyone anything except to try and do the right thing about the American people. So that involves tackling a lot of what's gone wrong, because right now in the United States of America, everything revolves around the almighty dollar. That's the tough, sad truth of it. The way we make it work for us is we actually start putting more dollars into our hands and give ourselves a seat at the table, make ourselves owners and shareholders in the 21st century economy. It's been an exciting two years, I have to say. Like I came to this, it is my 22nd time in the state. I actually think it's more like 23rd or 24th, but I don't want to cheat and tell me it's 22. <laughs> And every time I've come back, there's been more energy, more enthusiasm. This has been the building of the wave over the last two years. And the question is, what are we going to do with this wave, this power? Because if we don't take advantage of this opportunity, we're in for four more years of what? What happens over the next four years? More stores close, the AI gets smarter, call centers start disappearing, the robot trucks are getting closer and closer to the highways. This is the tide we're in the midst of, and it's up to you all to turn the tide. 
as quickly as possible. You are the only ones who can do it. There is no other New Hampshire. If you miss the opportunity, then it goes, and then we've got four more years of the fourth industrial revolution washing over our communities. Yeah, that's, again, that's why I love being here. I'm not running for president because I fantasize about being president of the United States. I'm running for president because like many of you here in this room, I'm a parent and I'm a patriot and I've seen the future that awaits our kids. It is not something I'm willing to accept. I don't believe you should accept it either. So this is the opportunity. We have to take it. If we don't take it, it's going to be lost to us for quite some time. You saw it start with the factories up north. Now it's on the main streets. Soon it will be in your workplaces, in your restaurants, and on your highways. And this is our chance to make a stand, to say we're going to make it so that this economy works for us, that we are not bystanders to these changes in our society. We can actually take control of them. But it, it's going to be up to us to actually get up there and start rewriting the rules, because right now we're confusing economic value and human value and it's destroying us. What do I mean by that? What I'm saying is right now we're valuing each person by what the market says they're worth. If the market says you're worth zero, then now you are worthless. That's why you end up in situations where you actually say we should try and turn coal miners into coders. Because if you don't have any economic value, then we have to try and move heaven and earth to make you have economic value, even if that makes no sense at all even if it's ridiculous to suggest that these coal miners are going to become coders at scale in a reasonable way. That's the challenge we're in the midst of. We, what we did to the coal miners, we're going to do, and one of the things I say is it doesn't matter if the trucker is hardworking and conscientious or not hardworking and conscientious, the robot truck's going to be better than both of them. It doesn't matter if the radiologist has been studying very diligently. The AI can see shades of gray on a radiology film that the human eye cannot, and it can reference millions of data points more than any human doctor. So if we keep chasing these goals that are moving away from us, we're going to lose on an epic scale. We have to reconceptualize how we measure our own value, how we think about ourselves. Are we going to be inputs into the giant capital efficiency machine in a race we cannot win? Or are we going to say we're citizens, we're Americans, each of us has value, and we can determine that in a way that the market cannot? I know you came here tonight and you were like, hey, this is a political talk and now I have to make Amazon pay taxes, to rewrite the rules of the economy, I have to do all of these things. But that is the wonder. That is the wonder of this place. If I was in any other part of the country, we'd be having a hypothetical discussion. Here in New Hampshire, this is all too real. That's why I love it here so much. So I'm excited to take some questions from each of you, but it's going to be up to you to make history in 2020, and I know you will do just that. Thank you all so much.
or and donation drive? Oh, thank you for the incredible question. Wow. It's been a real education and mystery for, for me as well. Uh, I showed up and thought to myself, well, the media will be fascinated in the narrative as to why Trump won and how we can start moving the country forward. I was incorrect on that front. <laughs> the media has its own set of narratives that it seems to be really, really intent on maintaining. Uh, it's been a disappointment, to be honest. Uh, it's made me appreciate all the more people like you who have helped make the case to your family members and your friends, because that is the only way we're going to make significant change in this country. It's not going to be waiting for the companies to start caring about us. Apparently, we'll be waiting forever if we wait for that. It's going to be up to us to make the case to our family members and friends and neighbors and care about each other and ourselves. I'm happy to say that the media does respond to success in a particular way, where I have seen some journalists light bulbs go off, where they're like, wait a minute, this guy has already beaten half a dozen senators and governors and Congress people. He's polling ahead of many well-known national figures, and I never heard of him eight months ago. Maybe we should dig into what he's saying. <laughs> um, so I'm happy to say it is turning in, in that way. CNN in particular, I think, has been very, very above board and professional. And you could actually tell at different debates what was going on with the moderators, where when CNN moderated, they asked substantive questions about my platform in a way that some of the other networks have not. Uh, so it's been an education. The way we beat it is we just keep on spreading the word, spreading the message, and make it so that it's completely irresponsible journalism for them not to acknowledge and include us. But thank you. Thank you. That was awesome. Uh, the, the Joe Rogan, how many of you saw the Joe Rogan podcast that he referenced? All right, so um, if, if you haven't, uh, it's a fun conversation. It's been one of the main things that's driven people to the campaign. If you don't like Joe Rogan, it's cool. <laughs> He's a very strong, strongly built, sturdy man. <laughs> <laughs> He's got what I, I refer to as a man hanger. Like, a men aspire to have a man cave. That man has a man hanger with a door <laughs> man hanger full of stuff. It's like a sports car, a gym, a float tank. Anyway. <laughs> Yeah, there's a lot of testosterone in that. Right <laughs> um, I like to go man, woman, so let's go this way. Thank you. Hi, my name is Nicole Ives, and I'm a resident here in Hanover. Um, I'm, my father's African American, my mom is uh, European American, white. And um, I'd like to know, I, I agree with what you say, that Trump is a symptom of, um, rather than the cause. Um, in addition to economic issues, there's an underlying um, just ra racism that is, is just ripping this country apart. And I'd like to know um, how you see healing that divide. Thank you for the question. <clears throat> I agree with you. Uh, I think that the economic issues and the race issues in this country are intertwined. And unfortunately, we know that poverty and race overlap very, very significantly, or pretty much in lockstep uh, in this country. So there are a number of things we have to do, in my opinion. Uh, I think if we start valuing ourselves independent of the market, that's actually going to help us move towards racial healing. Because right now, there's this feeling that if Certain groups are winning and certain other groups are losing. That's like this mindset of scarcity that we're trapped in as a country, where if someone else is winning, then you're losing, and there's not enough to go around. Now, what's the opposite of a mindset of scarcity? Mindset of abundance, which is you win, I win, you're doing well, that's good for me. And then if your family is prospering or your community is prospering, then that's great, and my family can prosper too. So much of what I believe ails us is this boot on our throats that's causing this mindset of scarcity, where 78% of Americans are living paycheck to paycheck, almost half of us can't afford an unexpected $500 bill, and so in that context, if I say immigrants are to blame, or these other groups are behind your problem, then you become much more receptive to that. 
if your future is secure and stable and your kid's future is secure and stable and someone comes to you and says, hey, we need to try and do positive things and move the country forward and address things like climate change, you're gonna be much more likely to be positive and responsive. And I believe that's the crucial first step in moving us towards some degree of racial healing where people don't feel like if another group is doing well, that it's somehow hurting them or bad for them if there's not enough to go around. It's always good to have a question from a white-haired lady. My name is Margaret Campbell. I'm from Lebanon. Thank you for coming. The staff uh, that you have that I've talked to or met are great. Ah, yes. I would like to know your plan for improving child care and early childhood education. So I've got two young kids who are seven and four, and I believe that early childhood education is this massive missing piece in our system right now. Because if someone shows up to kindergarten or even pre-K, oftentimes they're already behind, and teachers realize this. Where if you look at the studies, how many of y'all are educators? I sense there are educators in this room. So if you're an educator, you know that two-thirds of your kids' educational outcomes are determined outside of school. Uh, that's dependent upon parental time spent with them, stress levels in the house, <coughs> income, unfortunately, words read to them when they're young. And so some of them are showing up to school already behind or after a summer, like more behind than they were when they left. So the first big step is to stop putting resources just into our institutions and directly into homes and families, which will then give the kid a better chance to learn and develop. And the, par the parents, chance to spend more time with the kid and prepare them to actually learn when they get to school. So we should be paying for pre-K for everyone, we should be subsidizing daycare at very high levels because right now it's an impossible choice for many families to try and figure out how they're going to afford health care if they decide to work. But we should also be putting this freedom dividend of $1,000 a month into families' hands, which if you have two adults in their household, that's $24,000 a year, and that may enable one of the parents to stay home with the child if that's what they decide to do. To me, we have to try and create real choice for families. And that is that does include subsidizing daycare, but it also includes making it more possible for a parent to actually stay home with the child if that's what the family wants. No problem. Direct me. <laughs> um, sure. Okay. About climate change, I wanted to ask and. What are, do you have a plan to reduce emissions other than the CO2? Like, there are other greenhouse gases, like methane, ground level ozone, <coughs> nitrous oxide, which is the same thing as laughing gas, CFCs, which are already banned, because those are about half of, and soot, soot emissions. Those are over half of the thermal budget climate change. And I don't think we can stay below two degrees without tackling those. Do you have a plan for those? Yes. How many of you all are concerned about climate change? If you don't have your hand up, you probably should. Who I found who doesn't have a hand up? <laughs> <laughs> if you saw a few debates ago, I staked out the new third position in American politics on climate change. Position number one is we need to fight climate change. Position number two is climate change is a hoax. We don't need to worry about it. Position number three is that it's worse than you think. We are decades behind. And that is where I, I am. That's where the science is, unfortunately. I was in Portsmouth, and there are buildings that are flooding regularly that were not flooding a number of years ago. And a multi-million dollar shrimping business that went to zero because of warming waters uh, killing the shrimp. Oh, look at that. No. Oh, yeah, I got Yeah, that's incredible. Uh, sure. <laughs> Sure, I'll pocket these for later. <laughs> so the question is, how do we start turning the tide on climate change, given that we're decades behind the curve? And uh, I, I'm proposing five things. You can go to my website and see there's a 60-page plan, so I don't want to go into it all right now. But first, what you're saying is 100% correct, that we need to price in the cost of emissions. 
And this is the tug of war that we're in on climate change that we have to change. And it involves in part the measurements I was talking about before. When you go to Americans and say, hey, we need to fight climate change, a lot of them hear three things. My prices are gonna be higher, my life's gonna be more inconvenient, and jobs will be harder to come by, right? And the reason why they think this way is because they're thinking in our current economic measurements that fail to take into account the cost of climate change itself. How much is climate change gonna cost? Trillion, tens of trillions of dollars and hundreds of thousands of lives, really. So if you actually start costing that in, you know what's really expensive? Doing nothing, or just letting climate change continue to accelerate. The problem is we're not internalizing the cost of climate change. And one of the most powerful ways we can internalize that cost is by pricing emissions in. So if you emit methane or CO2, then you actually have to pay for that emission. And then corporate incentives will line up with how much they're polluting. My basic message is that American companies only respond to one set of incentives. I asked 70 CEOs, I said, how many of you are looking at using artificial intelligence to replace your back office clerical workers? Guess how many hands went up out of 70? All 70. The fact is you could fire any CEO who didn't have their hand up because their incentives are just to optimize for the bottom line. So if we want the drug companies to do right by us, if we want the energy companies and manufacturing companies, you have to price in the things that they're emitting, the negative externalities. So that's one big pillar. The next is to take the subsidies that we're giving to the fossil fuel industries, zero them out, and move them to wind and solar. The third thing is the toughest part. The United States of America only accounts for 15% of global emissions. 85% is the rest of the world. What's happening in the rest of the world is that China is going to Africa and saying, great news, we've got a coal burning power plant for you. And then what does African, uh, what do the African government say? Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Great. Like they don't care about emissions, they're trying to get energy cheap. So what do we have to do if we want to change that? Go to the same government and say, don't take the coal burning power plant, take these solar panels instead. And we're going to subsidize them to a point where this is actually a better move for you. If you want to get the other 85%, that's what you have to do locally. You have to start trying to lead in that direction. The fourth thing is I would face facts and say, look, climate change is already upon us. We're already seeing extreme weather events flooding, droughts, fires, hurricanes, and we need to start investing directly in our communities to try and make ourselves more resilient now, today. And we can actually save money by trying to invest it now as opposed to waiting until after the disaster. The disaster itself is very, very expensive. The Freedom Dividend will also help because who suffers the most in a natural disaster? The poorest people who don't have cars to get into and shelters to go to and the rest of it. So by putting economic resources into our hands, we actually enable our people and our families to protect themselves. The fifth thing is I would propose a constitutional amendment around climate change and say this is an intergenerational responsibility and we need to safeguard the environment for our kids. I wish I had a, a, more, like a happier outlook on climate change, but it's very, very rough. Hi, um, I followed you from the, the King Talk, and on the way I was looking at your website, uh, and specifically something you mentioned uh, in the policy about making taxes fun, you talked about a revenue day, which I was really excited to learn about. Um, but also in there, you talked about each American being able to direct 1% of their taxes to a specific project that the government will fund. And I was wondering if I would be able to use my own tax money to help um, homeless people transition if you actually implemented UBI. Homeless and like, people transitioning. Yeah, because like, I understand that homeless people would be like eligible to get UBI, but I don't think that would like solve the homeless problem. Exactly. So they still need like help transitioning in that. And I want to like. Being from Manchester, homelessness is like a big issue, so. Yeah, I love this question so much. So for those of you who are like, revenue day, what the heck is that? So, saying you're gonna run the government like a business is generally pretty dumb, because they're not the same things. And if you tried to run the government like a business, it would not go that well, because in a business you can tell everyone what to do, and in a government you can do that a little bit, but more of it is trying to gather consensus and trying to get people on board with a vision. But if you were a business and you were receiving hundreds of billions of dollars on a particular day, 
you're probably be pretty happy that day. You know, instead of making tax day this onerous burden for us, we're like, oh, I hate this, April 15th, this is the worst. Instead, you call it revenue day, you make the national holiday, everyone has the day off, you celebrate the continuance of your of your government in your country, you bring families in to celebrate with you in the White House lawn and say, we've got a family from every state here to celebrate. You get a thank you message from Tom Hanks or Oprah or The Rock <laughs> saying this is what your tax dollars are going to. You get to designate 1%, and in your case, what was your name? In Aiden's case, it would be to try and help get homeless people to shelter and off the street. Would you feel a little bit better about tax day if all this went on? This to me is just basic customer service. Like, you know, if you're gonna get hundreds of billions of dollars in revenue, you probably say thank you. <laughs> now to the homelessness crisis, right now when you're a nonprofit or agency and you find a homeless person, the first thing you do is try to figure out whether they're eligible for any government programs and benefits. First thing you do. So in the world of the freedom dividend, thanks to you all, Everyone is going to be entitled to a thousand bucks a month, which means if I'm a nonprofit or agency trying to help homeless people, I know I've got a thousand bucks a month to work with for every person I'm helping. And so then you have a massive increase in resources to try and get someone off the street and plugged into a shelter or stable infrastructure. And if you think about this, there's immense value around trying to get that person incorporated into society for us, obviously, as a people but also for some of the corporate actors, where do you think that the corporate actors would be like, wait a minute, like, does this person need a bank account? Right. Probably, because they need to get the freedom dividend. It's like, and so it actually creates this massive increase in resources to try and invest in people. Because right now, if you're a nonprofit or agency, what is your economic incentive to help someone get in off the street? It's very unclear. And on a, you know, you have a budget maybe, but the budget doesn't scale based upon the number of people you help. Whereas here, you actually get an economic incentive for every person you help, and it ends up being like a tenfold increase in the level of resources to address homelessness. So yeah, you could, you could definitely designate that. stage in a jingoistic manner. How do we re-engage those people in becoming productive, thoughtful citizens that help shape the, the, the path moving forward? What an incredible question. I'm very proud of the fact that this is already happening. Where there's a poll in New Hampshire that said that I was one of only two candidates that 10% or more of Donald Trump voters would support in the general election over Donald Trump. Because I'm talking about the same problems that they see around them and solutions that they can understand. Some of them said to me that they voted for Donald Trump hoping that he was going to do some of the things I'm describing. This also, not coincidentally, makes me the best candidate to take on and beat Donald Trump in the general election. What's the number one criteria that Democratic primary voters have for the nominee? Beat Donald Trump. And I am the lone candidate that is already drawing in thousands and thousands of disaffected Trump voters, as well as independents and libertarians, and Democrats and progressives. 
I can build a much broader coalition to take on Donald Trump and beat him because I'm talking about the very problems that got him elected. Now you're 100% right that the hard work begins when you actually have the governance on the problems. So I want you all to visualize this with me because I've done it very, very often. Andrew Yang sweeps into the White House, 2021 inauguration day. Everyone's like, wow, we're doing this thing. <laughs> this is happening. Democrats and progressives are thrilled to have beaten Donald Trump. That's like their big hope, their big goal. And they will be thrilled, you will be thrilled, to put money into the hands of families and make people stronger, healthier, mentally healthier, more productive. But if you look at the Republicans in Congress, they're gonna look at this and say, wait a minute, am I against the dividend? Who are the big winners of the dividend? Red states that have lost a lot of these manufacturing jobs, rural areas, and cash is very, very hard to argue against. Mitch McConnell can't be like, this cash is gonna hurt you. <laughs> it's a very difficult argument. And, and we, hell, he'll make it. But I want you to imagine his phone lines and his office when he's making that, and I'm standing in front of his office being like, Mitch is standing between you and the dividend. The fact is conservatives don't dislike money in people's hands and economic freedom on the part of Americans. Conservatives dislike a giant bureaucracy making everyone's decisions for them. Alaska, the only state that's had a dividend for almost 40 years, a deep red conservative state, and it was passed by a Republican governor. And I don't need 80% of Congress to make this happen, I just need a majority. So I can peel off enough Republicans so they say, look, this is not partisan, this is the dividend. I like the dividend. And Republicans sense that I'm not particularly ideological and I'll work with anybody. My administration will reflect that. As long as you're bent on improving the lives of the American people and you're a team player, we'll bring you in. I think good ideas are independent of your party affiliation. I just came from a town hall in Keene. How many of you were at the town hall in Keene? A couple of you. The last three people I talked to in Keene before I came here said that they voted for Donald Trump. And they now see that he uh, did not work out the way they hoped, and they're supporting me. So the anger you're talking about is real, and I believe I'm actually tapping into a productive way forward for people who feel that anger because I'm explaining the source of that anger uh, and one thing that a friend of mine told me, whose mom is an avid Fox watcher, she said, Yang is the only Democrat that I will support because he's the only one I do not feel is judging me. And that is one of the ways we tamp down the anger because I have no judgment for the suffering or the cause of the problems. All I want to do is help move us forward. of our own data, and we have a set of rules for the tech companies. Number one, you have to tell us what you're doing with our data. So if you're selling, reselling, you have to inventory and audit it. Number two, to the extent you get value from it, we need to share in that value. You now, if you're gonna get paid, we get paid too. Number three, we have to have the ability to turn this off if we so desire. Now, this is not like a one-way street, we can actually unplug. Now the metadata, that was your name? Now the metadata that Christina is talking about is she's right, immensely valuable, which is a, what, what you essentially take all of our data and then you anonymize it, and then you see what the trends are based upon all the data points. And so it doesn't need to, doesn't need to know it's Christina or Andrew, it can just do it based upon the composite data points. And she's right that you can get billions and billions of dollars of value off of that. And a lot of control, you can get a lot of control. 
and a lot of control. A lot of very smart people are working on what they can do with metadata. Again, this is why it's the new oil. So the goal is to start with this, essentially this data bill of rights and give it to us. And the transactions, the value share, we intend to make possible would include all transactions that are derivatives of our data, even if it's not individual and personalized. So just if our data is part of the giant data set and we get like a tiny, tiny smidgen. And the, the goal here is to just acknowledge who we are as people. Like none of us are really gonna do anything <laughs> with this technology set of preferences unless something blows up in our faces, right? We'll, we'll turn the dial to a particular preference set and then we'll take comfort in the fact that the government is looking out for us with this audit and we're getting checks periodically. And as long as that continues and nothing terrible happens, then we'll be much, much better off because we are outgunned by these companies. Uh, it's not a fair fight. It's not a fair fight. The only counterweight is the government. And I don't love that answer in the sense that I, I consider myself a realist about what government can and can't do, but there is no other choice. Asking the tech companies to self-regulate is ridiculous and self-defeating because just like every other company in our country, they just revolve around the bottom line. The most extreme example of this, how many of y'all are parents like me? So if you're a parent, you know that our kids are getting mesmerized by these screens. And we have some of the smartest engineers in the country turning supercomputers into dopamine delivery devices and slot machines for teenage girls in particular. And they do this because they profit to the tune again of millions and millions of dollars. And then they say, hey parent, like you should control that. It's ridiculous. We're totally outgunned again. You have this technology that's working and it's rewiring our kids' brains. And you say to our kids, I'll just give you the story of my, my own family. It's like you say to your son, it's like, hey, stop using the screen. And then they say, Daddy, you're using the screen. <laughs> and he is correct. <laughs> I am using the screen. And then I say, well, don't do it when I'm around. <laughs> but then what happens when I'm not around? We know what happens. Uh, and, and so we have to get into the guts of these apps and devices and actually calibrate all of the design choices they're making. Because right now, what are they calibrated for? Yeah. Maximum revenue. <laughs> No, maximum addictiveness, maximum user engagement. Maximum data stock. Maximum data stock. I have friends in Silicon Valley, you know who are the most vigilant about not letting their kids use screens? <laughs> Them! You've never seen a more screen-free environment in your life than when you go to the homes of these technologists because they know what's going on. It's, it's so dark. But this is the reality of the world that we are leaving to our kids in 2019. I, that, was, that, was a, that was the first time I've been asked about metadata, Christina. I appreciate that. Hi. Um, so I have a question because my dad works part time and is currently getting Social Security as a primary source of income. I'm, my stepmom is on disability insurance, has been for a while, and I'm wondering if the Freedom Dividend would still be given to them, would it stack on top of those benefits? We're facing a retirement crisis in this country and millions of Americans will never be able to retire. Uh, and so we have to ask ourselves fundamentally, do we want to be a country where elderly Americans and seniors are working until the day they die, or do we want people to be able to retire with dignity? To me, it's very clear we should choose the latter, and this would help balance our economic resources to help care for baby boomers as they age and retire. The Freedom Dividend stacks on top of Social Security. It would be the greatest increase in Social Security benefits in history. And this is, in my mind, necessary because Social Security is not sufficient to be able to retire on. Millions of Americans have no meaningful retirement savings. And your Social Security benefits disadvantage people who took time off from the workforce often to raise kids. So the moms get lower benefits than someone who's been in the workforce more. If you put $1,000 on top of it, all of a sudden the path to retirement becomes realistic for many Americans. And then you put resources into the communities to help maintain caregiving environments and other environments for seniors as they retire. Thank you. So like I said, on a personal level, I have no desire to live in a country where I walk into a convenience store and it's a senior working just to make ends meet. That should be a teenager working for beer money. Amen. <laughs> 
That's the way it was when I was growing up. And I didn't walk in and it was like, man, yeah, it's amazing. Like, we can do better than this. You know? I, again, it, it goes back to the economic value and human value. It's like if you're uh, if you're past your working years, it's like, well, you have no value. And it's like, no, it's like, you know, I mean, you're actually what we did it all for, presumably. You know, it's like, well, what's the purpose of being the richest, most advanced country in the history of the world if you're just going to have people consigned to destitution as they uh, age and retire? Hi, I'm Kat. I have a question about judicial reform. So going beyond your plan for changing it to an 18-year term limit, there are corporations such as the Heritage Foundation and Federalist Society that give a lot of money to influence both the election and the nomination of judges. Um, and these judges um, most recently have been anti-abortion. So what will you do to stop these corporations from being able to have so much influence and money over the, the process? Women's reproductive rights are fundamental human rights, and I will fight for them at every level as president. <laughs> what I used to say is that as a male, I should just leave the room and let women figure it out because I should not be making anyone's <laughs> reproductive decisions for them. But then I uh, heard from women that had said, I appreciate that sentiment, but the reality is you're going to have to actually fight for our rights, and I agree with that. Uh, the second part you're asking is, hey, you have these big organizations and companies that are donating money to try and change our judicial appointments. And this is a microcosm of one of the biggest problems in America today, which is that our government has been overrun by corporate money and lobbyist influence. I sometimes joke that we should hire our own lobbyists. It's like the only way we would ever get anything done for us. We'd be like, this lobbyist represents the American people. <laughs> hey, I'm here to take you out to dinner and <laughs> tell you what you should do. I've been running for president for long enough to see how the money gets into everything. And that the will of the people and the money are in different places. Because the money is with the companies, and they hire all of the ex-legislators. They can come in, you can count the money and feel it better. They can offer you jobs, and the food is better. <laughs> they have a lot of advantages. So the only way out, the only way out of this, is to try and unify the people and the money. Now the Freedom Dividend would help because having a thousand bucks a month would help. But I'm proposing that we actually give every voter 100 democracy dollars that only we can designate to candidates and campaigns, which would wash out the lobbyist cash by a factor of eight. So you have to ask yourselves, what's more realistic? That we're going to actually somehow get corporate money out of politics, even though it has been there for decades, even before you, Citizens United? Or that we can flush it out with a wave of people-powered money and make it so the legislators actually should listen to us, because if, if 10,000 of us get together and give someone or a democracy dollar, it's a million dollars. And then when some organization comes and says, hey, I've got $100,000 for you, it'd be like, oh, I, I don't want to take it because I'm getting a million dollars from the people. And they're going to see that my interests are actually diverging from theirs. So democracy dollars would be one way that we can counteract the influence of really big organizations that want to change our judicial or legislative processes. I'm a, it should be. Oh, I'm an assistant professor at Dartmouth College. Um, so I've been following your campaign uh, since uh, uh, probably March this year and uh, following the Joe Rogan show. Uh, it, it's been very impressive. And uh, I, I was wondering, um, so do you have, I mean, because right now you, you're polling 4% you know, to 5%, right? And um, what, what is your path to win, like your early, early, early states? And, but what do you think of other people's strategy? For example, um, Mel Pete, and he's recently been surging in the poll. Um, so what they what he did, and what what your strategy? Um, and also, do you consider doing uh, some other like additional trial UBIs, uh, like you did Freedom Dividends um, earlier um, in, in in some states? Because I think that was very effective. Um, so I'll start with the second question. I've been giving several families a thousand dollars a month for the last number of months including a family in Goffstown, New Hampshire. 
And what I say to people is that you think it's money, but it's actually about everything but the money. It's about someone paying for car repairs to visit their daughter. It's about someone buying a guitar and playing shows for the first time in years and actually being good. I mean, it's actually very, very good. <laughs> Uh, it's about someone going back to school at the age of 68, that the money in our hands means what we value most in our own lives. And I'm thrilled that that demonstration has been uh, really, really popular and of interest to people. Because if the Asian guy shows up and says, hey, everyone has a thousand bucks a month, you're like, okay, like I kind of imagine that. But then when you see your neighbor getting it, you're like, wait a minute, they got a thousand bucks a month? I'm like, how did that happen? And then also, the concerns seem ridiculous. It's like, it didn't hurt them. They like it. It makes their lives better. And you're like, of course that would happen in real life. Then when you talk about it in the abstract, somehow people are like, oh, that's somehow gonna you know, not be positive for people. So that's the freedom dividend component. As for the election strategy component, I'm thrilled to say that we are at four to six percent right now without taking into account the impact of advertising in any significant way. Because we just started, how many of you all have seen an Andrea yet? One. All right, good fun. Um, I'm gonna bet you saw it in the last one to two weeks. Is that correct? Because we did not start advertising until two and a half weeks ago. And the lead time between when advertising starts and when it starts impacting polling numbers is three to six weeks. So often what you see in terms of a surge in polls is a result of the fact that people have started advertising and that people have become familiar with that candidate. That's what you've seen with certain other candidates and that's what you're now seeing with us. But I'm thrilled to say that we have grown organically this entire way, essentially without the benefit of advertising. We raised $10 million last quarter. We raised $2 million in the last week. We are growing when other campaigns are shrinking. It's pretty wild and it's all grassroots funding. It's all people like you all tonight saying we can do better for ourselves and this is our chance to do so. So you're gonna see our poll numbers continue to rise in the days to come. And you know what's gonna really get our numbers through the roof here in New Hampshire? A New Year's Eve party. <laughs> <laughs> when people come and say that was the greatest New Year's Eve party I ever done. So you're gonna see some movement because we've just now put the resources to work successful at grassroots fundraising, I believe just cleared a million donors. We're a country of, let's call it 200 some odd million adults. So if you're like one million out of 200 million, it's like half of 1% of Americans donated to the most grassroots candidate that there is. Most Americans are not like you all in this room where they're paying deep attention to politics. Most Americans, many Americans unfortunately have concluded that politics does not work. It's just bad for their emotional state and mental health. People are not speaking to them in a real way, and they ignore it. And certainly most Americans don't take that extra step to donate some of their hard-earned cash to a candidate or campaign, so thank you for that. Now the way you change that with democracy dollars is you have $100, use it or lose it every single year, uh, and you essentially can assign it to a candidate or campaign. What percentage of Americans do you think would actually make a conscious choice as to what to do with their $100 if it was essentially free to them? So they're saying 75, 50, but it's certainly a lot higher than like half of 1%. <laughs> you know I mean? Then you might get to 30, you might get to 40%. And if you look at that number times $100, you wind up with uh, low billions of dollars, low even tens of billions of dollars. And all of the lobbyist cash combined is a small fraction of that. 
And so that's how we actually lo lo essentially wash out the lobbyist cash, by engaging more Americans in our society and government, because most of them are checked out and disengaged. I also want to give everyone $100 in prosperity grants every year that you can only donate to your favorite nonprofit, uh, because this would channel research. This is actually not even that expensive. You would channel money to nonprofits, but more importantly, you would make it so the nonprofit actually cares about the people it serves in a different way. Because I ran a nonprofit for seven years, and one of the major problems is that you're the people who are writing the checks over here, and then you have the recipients, right? And they're not the same at all. And so just like with our legislators, you start gravitating toward the money over time. Know what I mean? So if you had prosperity grants, then the people that you were serving could actually say, like, here's $100. You actually have a marketplace where nonprofits working for people that can't cut big checks would actually become a major uh, source of attention and resources. Here's the Republicans' follow-up question. How are you going to pay for that? So those two things in the scheme of our society are actually really inexpensive. You're talking about like low billions of dollars. Like the prosperity grants, you could literally fund just by getting rid of tax breaks for charitable donations over a certain level. They would actually, like that, that actually is a pay for, it's very, very easy. Uh, democracy dollars, it's similar when you look at how much would Americans spend for a government that actually responded to us? <laughs> like, uh, again, it's like a very, very efficient spend. On the foreign policy side, I signed a pledge to end the forever wars. We've been in a constant state of armed conflict for 18 years, and that is not what the American people want. That's not what the Constitution says. What did the Constitution say? Congress shall declare war. Congress essentially ceded its authority to the executive branch with the authorization, the use of military force in 2001, and then they washed their hands of it ever since. And that is not appropriate. We have to give the power to declare war back to Congress and back to the American people and start getting our troops home. We're spending $650 billion a year on a military industrial complex that is not necessarily always making us safer. We have to start trying to take those resources and make ourselves stronger and more whole here at home. So that's a sense of my foreign policy. Uh, I think that we benefit tremendously from this world order, and we have to invest in diplomacy and alliances and partnerships and let the rest of the world know. Can you imagine the rest of the world right now, they look up and they see, what the heck, Donald Trump's the American president, and now they don't know what's going on with us. I'm going to suggest to you all that after I'm president, they'll be like, wow, America turned that around really, really quickly. <laughs> What's your name, sir? Uh, Jamie, Jamie Orr. I couldn't agree more. What percentage of Americans will graduate from a four-year college? 33%. And that is relatively stable. It is not shot up from 25% over the last number of years. It's, it's more or less stable at 33%. So that means two-thirds of your workers are not going to graduate from college. So what is the plan? Only 6% of American high school students are in technical or vocational apprenticeship tracks. For context, in Germany, that's 59%. Think of that golf. And like you just said, electrician, plumber, really secure and lucrative professions. Can you imagine what it would take to make a robot plumber? That's impossible. <laughs> it's gonna be a human plumber for a long time. It's actually much easier to automate a way uh, an entry-level college graduate job than it is a lot of these technical hands-on jobs. So as your president, I will make massive investments in technical and vocational apprenticeship tracks, and I'll have a media campaign with Mike Rowe of Dirty Jobs, and we'll get together and say, hey, these are great jobs. These are really good jobs, and we'll have like commercials, and you know, Mike will, Mike will come in 
Um, because we, we are overemphasizing college, and it's, it's been a disaster, honestly. The six-year completion rate of four-year colleges right now is 59%. That means 41% of people who are starting college are not finishing within six years. Do the schools forgive their debt? No. We're up to $1.6 trillion, most of it college debt, because families feel like they have no choice but to send their kid to college, and college has gotten two and a half times more expensive. Has it gotten two and a half times better? No. no. So we've created this track that ends up burdening many of our young people with life-changing debt. They're sent into an economy that does not value their education at the levels commensurate with what they incurred. And you have all these other needs in the community that are left going empty because we've essentially stigmatized the trades and all these other forms of work. That's why I think the Mike Rowe thing is genuinely important. Because we have to send a message to our kids that college is not the end all be all and these other paths lead to great, great careers. Well, for those of you who are going to college, I want to make college less expensive too. Because that, that's not cool, what we've done to you all. Uh, it's, it really has gotten two and a half times more expensive without a, a real change in quality. Uh, well, I'm going to college a second time, so. <laughs> what, what does the teacher uh, mean? I was curious. Oh, it's sort of, it's unrelated. <laughs> It was, an, it was an event we ran before. Um, uh, my question is, you have talked a lot about different ideas for universal basic incomes, and one of them was Jamie Dimon's um, negative income tax. Yeah, so how did you decide upon the UBI that you ended up selecting that would go to everyone and not just, um, say, people making under a certain amount? And also, how did you decide on the amount of $1,000? The closest cousin to the freedom dividend or universal basic income that's currently in effect, aside from the Alaska Petroleum Dividend and uh, what's going on in some Indian reservations, is the earned income tax credit, where you get money back if you make below a certain amount. And the earned income tax credit is phenomenal. The only drawbacks are that about 30% of people that are eligible for the EITC don't get it because they don't file for it or they don't administer it correctly. And there's a massive timing of payments issue. Because if my car breaks down, I can't get to work, and someone comes and says, good news, you're going to get a tax credit next year, does that help you? And not particularly. So the freedom dividend, the universal basic income, gets over both of those problems because it's going to go to 100% of people, and the timing of payments is very, very regular. Uh, and because it's universal, there's no stigma attached to it. It's not. Like, I get it, you don't get it, uh, you know, you're paying for it, I'm not paying for it, because it's universal. If we wound up with something like a negative income tax, which is Jamie Dimon's idea, that would be a major step forward. I prefer the dividend because I think it's going to be more universal, administratively easy and low cost and powerful, but I completely respect and appreciate people who are proposing one of the variants of the plan. Last one? No. Are we going to do selfies? <coughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, uh, let's end on a high. <laughs> Sir, pressure's on. Uh, hopefully, I can live up to the hype. <laughs> Hi, Mr. Yang. My name is Connor. And unlike many of the people in this room, I was not born and raised in New Hampshire. I come from a very rural, very rural area of Arizona where there's a lot of ranchers and farmers. And I grew up on a dirt road literally called Dirt Road. <laughs> <laughs> but through a lot of hard work and a lot of luck, I made it up here to Dartmouth, where I'm now a senior. But the problem is, I keep seeing the same troubling story. When I ask a lot of people where they're from, they say things like St. Louis, Atlanta, Gwinnett, in my case, Florence, Arizona. But when I ask them where they are going to work after college, they say Boston, San Francisco, Seattle, LA, New York. Yep. So my question to you is, how do we bring more opportunities to these rural areas so they aren't being left behind by this brain drain and we don't see this gap in talent, opportunity, and economic outcomes? What's your name, sir? My name's Connor. Thank you. Let's give Connor a round of applause.
So Connor, I wrote a book on this subject and spent seven years working on it. And the joke we used to tell at Venture for America is that if you go to a school like Dartmouth, you're gonna do one of six things in six places. Let's see if you guys can name what the six things are in six places. Consulting, lawyer, doctor, investment banker, no, <laughs> not on the list. Um, technology or academic in New York, Boston, Seattle, San Francisco, LA, uh, Chicago. And this is not hyperbole, that is 8% of the people who go to the top 30 universities. And so I used to say very plainly, if you're the smart kid out of Arizona and you wind up at Dartmouth or Duke, the odds of you going to one of those six cities, 80% plus, what are the odds of you going back to Arizona? Very low. And if you do this for decades and you wind up with your intellectual capital going to Wall Street and coming up with mortgage-backed securities and the rest of it, or going to Silicon Valley and coming up with the app of the day, then over time you wind up with this disastrous winner-take-all economy that we have been saddled with. So I spent seven years running a nonprofit that recruited hundreds of young people like Connor to head back to various communities and build generative businesses. And it's, it's something I'm immensely proud of. But I actually saw just how much the deck is stacked against businesses in these communities. Where if you are an entrepreneur in technology in Cincinnati or Providence, I'll tell you guys a story about Providence, Rhode Island. There's a company that had 100 employees in Providence, Rhode Island, and was generating millions of dollars in revenue. The founders were in their 20s. You can imagine they must have been like the princes of the city, right? Like, 100 person company generating millions of dollars. Then a San Francisco venture capital firm said, hey, we're gonna give you $40 million to expand your business. But what was the condition? You have to move to San Francisco because we're on your board and we don't want to get on a plane and fly to Providence. But also we will make a legit argument that you're gonna be able to recruit better technical talent, better marketing talent, better executive talent here in San Francisco. So what did the entrepreneurs do? They took the money and they moved to San Francisco. Their 100 person office in Providence, Rhode Island went to zero. They then had a 100 person office in downtown San Francisco. Before they left Providence, the mayor of Providence went to their office and was like, please stay, please stay. Did that have any effect? No. I saw that story play out over and over again in various ways over seven years. It's one reason I'm running for president because I've realized that the market is not going to bail us out of this. The market is going to only accelerate dynamics that end up concentrating the benefits in the hands of the top 1%, the top 2%, who tend to live in the same places over and over again. So to me, the only way we can make it so that a young person like you, Connor, goes back to Arizona or any other area is if we make it so that there are economic opportunities in rural areas, in different communities around the country, and not just the same six mega cities. For those of you who live here in New Hampshire, right now your kids feel like they might have to leave the area or leave the state and go to Boston to access the kind of opportunities they need. Those dynamics are only going to get more and more powerful over time. I spent seven years trying to combat this tide and I concluded that the only way I can actually succeed is to run for president and win. So Connor, your mission is my mission. We can't make it so that kids at Dartmouth go back to different places unless they actually feel like they can build the kind of life and career that they want for themselves there. Other than that, they're just gonna keep on flocking to the same six cities unless we change it together. seven years trying to change it. Uh, it. The book was called Smart People Should Build Things. And I, I took some of the highlights and put them in my new book that I think we have copies of here. And I think they're free because we're in the magical land of New Hampshire, where again, we raise money other places and we spend it here. So thank you all so much. Let's make history together in 2020. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right, let's do some selfies. How are we going to do this thing? The plan is to mob the candidate. No, I'm kidding. Um, <laughs> we're going to get organized. That's where she made it.